probably go to room, uh, I will go to check the room. Three or four, four. Mm. Yeah, three people, three to four people. There's three this people ev fine. everywhere, yeah. except uh, in the four it is this. So I will now go to uh, room four because there's only two people. Uh, two people joined. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Hikaru, and thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I went to a school reunion tea party last week. And the current head teacher gave a short talk in the big hall, which was where I used to spend a lot of my time as a teenager, either bored in assemblies or taking a lot of exams. Mm. And it was, and it still is, an all boys school. And the head teacher was most proud in his talk of what he called a group of obsessive boys who had won a world championship robot competition and they were going off from England to defend their title in Texas shortly. And he seemed in this enthusiasm to be displaying quite a modern attitude towards new technology, to teamwork and following of your interests, your passions. And that impression was backed up as we toured around the new engineering labs and some very impressive art studios that are befitting for a, a well-funded educational institution. And also looking around, I was able to find the traditional old classrooms with their rigid desks and seating, which are very familiar in our system of education. And in our current system of education, we see everybody organized by year groups. So your cohort will be those people who share a nearby date of birth. Seems very arbitrary to me. You'll have a weekly repeated timetable with which you follow a curriculum, all of you studying the same material, leading you into traditional exams, still taken at the same age as your classmates. And then you go on, if you're successful, to a similarly narrow higher education establishment. If you're less successful, there may be a job for you, but you won't be expected to do much more learning. Now, this is a predictable and stable model, which has worked effectively for a century or so to get a percentage of students into university or off to the job market. And it's an offshoot of the factory system, an industrial model, which meant parents needed childminding that was tied to a convenient fixed location while they were off at work. One teacher can look after dozens of children in a single room, containing them until they are collected at the end of that day. And in this system, the teacher holds the discipline and is also the expert relative to the children in the topics that are taught. Um, any learning is actually incidentally a bonus, although these days most schools and educational institutions market it upfront as a big benefit. And there's a point to notice about access in this way of working that these traditional institutions lead to barriers and separations by class, wealth, color, and gender. And as we know, all of those have big consequences for the winners and for the losers, which are very difficult to eradicate as long as schools, along with universities, colleges, and apprenticeships are the focus of the system. So a summary slide of this paradigm looks like this. And this is not how we would start if we knew now what we could learn from that traditional system and some of its difficulties and failings. So how might it change? Let's keep in our imaginations the education budget the same as it is. So we've got the same money to spend, but we're gonna spend it differently in a shakeup. In the new system, the funding is going to go to your personal learning account for your own lifetime of learning. You have individual use of your education budget 
which maybe gets topped up every few years. You can choose to join projects. And in these projects, you'll create your own learning history and you can still have qualifications and certificates if you want them. So the focus switches to a lifetime experience with skills and reflection. And in the projects, you have shared development of your project communities. You get to know people just as we did in those friendship groups now, but over a longer period of time, working on something real together. Teachers become facilitators and we drop the expectation of hierarchy and knowledge from all being vested in the teacher. Teachers and facilitators also become learners within the projects. So they don't always have to be leading them. Sometimes they can be participating in other people's projects, other groups' projects. This way around, knowledge and expertise is generated. It's created rather than consumed. It's coached rather than lectured and it's discovered rather than being fixed. As we've learned during COVID, we can use the internet very extensively. We can use this for video, reading, webinars, library resources, and experts available to everyone around the world, irrespective of their geography. And all of these assets can be used both synchronously and asynchronously, so we can work more easily with time barriers and overcome those. And of course, in a system like that, your learning becomes more improvised. It's self-directed rather than part of a universal age-based curriculum. And the work itself becomes more collaborative, whereas in the old system, it's a very individual focus on results. Uh, if you copy anyone in the current system or learn from them directly by looking at their, their notes or their work, it's called cheating and is very much frowned upon. Discipline in this new way comes under your own responsibility and your responsibilities to the groups that you're part of. So what does that look like? Look on the slide. Personal lifetime learning account, collaborative project communities, teachers as facilitators, coaches and mentors, and knowledge and expertise is created rather than consumed. Now, we do have some of those elements currently. There's a uh, vogue for flipped learning, used to be called accelerated learning, which embodies many of these principles, but they're still very much a minority sport. How can we get them to be more widespread? And let's reconsider what kind of knowledge we're talking about creating, if we're gonna create knowledge, how much of the current, how much of the content of what you learned at school can you remember? Not much in my case. And how much of that is up to date? Knowledge decays and becomes obsolete increasingly fast. So learning a set of facts is generally not terribly useful because we can find them easily elsewhere and they are out of date rapidly. Instead, we want to be able to learn to learn core skills, core concepts. And I'm gonna propose that we learn something along the lines of LifePass. LifePass is a handy acronym to describe the eight tenets of applied improvisation. I'm going to put in the chat a link to the LifePass booklet, which you can download for free. Um, <laughs> I will be sharing it on the screen with you as well. There's the link. And here we see Life Pass. Let go, inhabit the moment, freedom within structure, embrace uncertainty, play to play, accept and build, short turn taking and spot successes. Let's have a look at each of those in a bit more detail and see how they connect to our work as facilitators, teachers and educators. The L is for let go. We can usefully let go of much that's in our lives. Here we're talking especially about letting go of perfectionism 
and letting go of the plan. When we let go of the need to be perfect, we're not bound any longer by our own guarantee that everything's going to turn out all right. We become free to have a go, to experiment, to test. Similarly, we can let go of the plan. The plan is not divine, usually, not usually. So if it's not working out for the best, what are we going to do? How comfortable are we going to be to do things that depart from a plan? If it's not working, we either change it, we can flex the plan, or we can dispose of it, let it go. And when we let go of any particular process, that allows for exploration. We can use our curiosity that's at the heart of education. The plan is replaced by an invitation to try, test and experiment. If we let go of a particular outcome, we're in a safe learning environment, a learning laboratory, then we can see what happens without pressure. Each experiment produces a result, and those results may prove useful depending on what we want to accomplish next. Inviting people to have a go and try things is a call to action. If people are stuck, which they often are, then doing something, almost anything, will produce change and probably create some useful momentum. When we have a go, the world responds, and that then guides the next step, which may be easier, partly because our perspective will have changed as we learn new things, and partly because we're already in movement. We're actors and agents taking some responsibility, actively participating. The I is for inhabiting the moment, which means bringing your attention to the here and now. Here is being present in space, and now is being present in time. So inhabiting the moment is a full body sport that results in tremendous presence. It's very different from sitting at that rigid desk in the classroom, hoping to learn something from the teacher or trying to avoid the voice or the eye of the teacher. It's about being in the moment and participating. If your mind wanders to the past or the future, or if your attention isn't on what's happening here and now, it goes somewhere else, then you're no longer inhabiting the moment. And improvisation, as many of you will know, is largely about teaching the skill of directing attention in a relaxed yet focused way so that we attend with the necessary degree of detail to the matter at hand while maintaining sufficient peripheral attention, the things that are further around us, to keep ourselves safe and to pick up signals of when it's time to move on. When you're present in the moment, you have no anxiety about the future or the past. This is also a very good state for learning. You're conscious only of now. In contrast, if you're thinking about the past, you're reviewing whether you did something right or wrong, or you place your attention to the future, wondering what you might be doing in a few hours or a few days for now. And those are remarkable human abilities with infinite uses. So we're not abandoning our ability to look back or to look forward, but we're saying we could more usefully be in the moment at times trusting that things will look after themselves as we move through time. And that reminds me very much of the state of young children. They're very present in time, and that gives them a certain freedom and ability at their time of maximum learning, when they're learning all life skills, usually before they go to school and have that shaken out of them. But of course, you'll find techniques in the practices of meditation and mindfulness for letting go of this tendency to put our attention to the past and the future. What's distinctive about improvisation within the range of mindfulness and meditation practices is that improvisers have more awareness of the social as well as the personal. When we're interacting with other people, then staying in the moment is very likely to be dynamic and exciting as well as reflective and intense. The F is for freedom within structure, which in itself is a useful definition of improvisation. There's a skill in identifying the structure, such as a set of rules in a game or in an organization, and the freedom which that structure permits for any number of possibilities. Every playing of the game is different. It's infinite variety in many of these games and structures. People often think first of the freedom in improvisation. The structures are equally important. You can't have one without the other. There's always freedom to be found in any structure. And whenever we create an experience as educators, 
we're providing a structure for those participants. An individual activity has a structure. rules or moves that are allowed and playing many of the structures. Embrace uncertainty. Much of life is unpredictable. It's subject to emergence, what happens as it happens in a space of uncertainty. There's little value in pretending we know what the result will be when we don't. And yet teachers and schools are set up as if they do know what the results are going to be. It makes sense to trade the illusion of control for the reality of influence. For example, we often have choices of how much risk to accept. As we make these choices, we may want to keep our feet on the ground to maintain a degree of safety. When we feel safe, that boosts our feelings of confidence and that enables us in turn to be willing to embrace further uncertainty. As you gain that confidence in your own resourcefulness, soon you begin to anticipate and enjoy the uncertainty, to be more comfortable with it. You gain what Keith Johnson calls the excitement and the reward of adventure, of playing with unknown outcomes. And children, of course, are very good at this. And yet they're constrained from using that skill rather than having that skill applauded and developed. Likewise with children, they play, of course, learning by playing. I'm suggesting that we do more play to play as well as playing to win and using play to learn as an important part of the educational process. So what's the difference between these? Some games have clear winners and losers. And the only point for many participants is that they play those games to win. And that's fine if that's the appropriate circumstance. The extreme emotional results are triumph or despair. The education system is largely win-lose. It was divided into different types of schools in the UK for different types of people to end up in the right types of employment, creating huge barriers, win and lose. But some people are good at enjoying a game no matter what's going on. So I, for example, have chased a ball in football, in tennis and in squash, and I really enjoy the workout, the exercise. I like the tactics of each point, and while it's nice to win, it's okay to lose. What's great when I'm playing a sport, certainly these days, is to enter the zone or a state of flow. And that's what play to play is about. We enjoy the game for what the game brings. And then on reflection, we can also use the experience of playing to learn, play to learn. Each game affords me an opportunity with or without real world consequences, depending on the context, to observe, notice, test and experiment. Playing to learn. There's learning to be gleaned during the game. I can adapt and adjust. And by reflecting afterwards, I can have learning that I transfer to the next game and also to other settings. Being playful means you're engaging and being flexible. When you are less engaged with the world, when you're more rigid and unresponsive, you're more likely to become suppressed and depressed. And we see a lot of depression amongst students globally, increasing rising anxiety because of this lack of invitation to be responsive, flexible, and adaptable. So what if education and work were both more like play? It's a very rare project that can't be improved by having a more playful approach. There's a strange phenomenon in which as we gain more responsibility as an adult, we seem to accompany it with a loss of the joy of play. Maybe you had a moment as a child when you were growing up and you felt you had to stop playing with your toys. I'm too old to be doing this. I have to act like an adult. And there's a danger of draining the enjoyment out of play even while you're playing. The answer isn't to stop playing, it's to seek and create better games, better projects that are more sophisticated and more demanding and that teach new lessons. That's gonna be the role of the teacher as facilitator. And then we can use the improvisational elements of those games, for example, to study status transactions. Status is the dynamic of who's up and who's down as any interaction progresses. And that means every game allows you to experiment with, say, with status. It's an ever flexible set of indicators of who's dominating, who's striving, who's submitting. 
it's teaching us the heart and essence of social skills. So when you get skilled at raising and lowering your status in relation to other players, you can apply this ability to increase your influence in all of the environments that you appear in. And you can diffuse tension in conflicts, for example, by acknowledging a wise point made by the other party. That's a classic raise their status move and a tremendously useful skill that everyone can learn while they're engaged in useful projects. The A is for accept and build, often captured in the phrase yes and, which is the lifeblood of improvisation. This appears in every improvisation book that's ever been written. <laughs> uh, yes, I have checked. And accepting is not the same as agreeing. Accepting is hearing what's on offer and taking account of it as part of that here and now that we mentioned earlier. We choose, as someone is saying in the chat here, between many responses to what's presented to us. Those responses can include no, no but, yes but, any of which may be appropriate, but none of those would be the same as accepting and building. To accept and build requires a stance, which may or may not include saying the actual words of yes and that. The and indicates that you're building on the yes, you're adding to what's offered, you're developing the situation to complete your turn. Before we become aware of improvisation as a articulated concept, then accepting and building can be a great challenge for people. It means a radical shift from a default positioning, a listening stance of an automatic no, switching it to a provisional yes. Education could provide a context of trust where our responses are more improvisationally selected based on the specific merits of what we're hearing and noticing. Whereas currently, I hear that the higher academic tradition requires an attitude of suspicion and test to destruction. And when that stance of critical analysis is exported from the academic pursuit itself into every meeting with staff, colleagues and students, that becomes very wary and tiring. If we want to create things with other people, then yes, and as a stance is generative and fruitful. And when one party introduces yes, and that might be the facilitator or the teacher, it serves as an invitation for others to join in. And when a yes, and approach is shared, co-creation starts to happen and take off. Companies like Google, Apple, Pixar and Twitter all use improvisation within their organizations, more or less explicitly. And the yes and then becomes into their DNA. Several of those are based in the San Francisco area, where it's commonplace to attend improvisation classes and shows. It's a normal part of what they do. Whereas within other parts of the world, within English companies, English schools, for example, improvisation is treated as unknown and suspicious or frivolous and unnecessary. I think the success stories from California and elsewhere will increasingly influence the way that societies choose to organize themselves because those that fail to improvise better are gonna get left behind. Whereas those that take it on will have a competitive advantage. The most talented leaders will demand outlets for their creative and improvisational impulses. A couple more elements of life parts. The S is short turn taking is a fast track to flow. It accentuates the desirable habits of paying close attention to what others are up to and what your part is in the ensemble, the bigger picture. Sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow. And then leadership can emerge and your team can self-organize. We use the jazzy idea of jamming, riffing back and forth, trading notes, and this leads to co-creation. We enjoy the flexibility of switching rapidly between leading roles and following roles. And it's the built-in turn-taking that makes racket sports so compelling for players and spectators. It's what gives dialogue an advantage over monologue in theater. And it separates good companions from boring companions in conversations. We make progress by capitalizing on success. Failure is hugely overrated. Every failure in evolution is quietly left behind. Yeah. If you use what's working, your successes, then you're on solid ground. And improvisation 
is making use of the ingredients available to you. You're rearranging the resources that are present to your advantage. Connecting with successes makes it easier to say yes to our experience. We enjoy reconnecting with what went well and the successes that we've had. And these successes remind us of our resources, our skills and our abilities, which is exactly what we're going to need to make progress from here. So I would say that improvisation is about making wise use of our resources. So in the new system, we would all learn these skills and these concepts in our chosen projects via practice and reflection. And that's part of what we call third wave applied improvisation. The first wave of improvisation was theatre classes, teaching you to perform on stage. The second city, the nursery, Sprout, every city, every big city has one of these institutions. The second wave is when these are taken from the theatre context into life contexts in workshops and trainings and programmes, leadership, creativity, collaboration. These are the titles of the sessions and then they use improvisational ideas free of the stage. They're not aiming to make you perform or put you in a position to perform, but to use those skills from improvisational activities in life. And the third wave, the wave that is upon us now is a really exciting wave, is improvisation in life, day to day, learning as you go while you're doing your work or your social activities. So you could be getting your improvisational input and feed and thoughts and prompts, maybe from an app, as Simo is going to describe in a few minutes. It could be from a book or from a quick coaching session, or importantly in improvisation, it's sorry, importantly in education from facilitation someone helping to facilitate an event to bring those improvisational elements into the project itself. And of course, those can be supplemented by second wave workshops, if that's appropriate, to develop, let's say, status practice. But note the shift of expertise. In the third wave, we're all improvisers. We're all experts. And the learning that you get will hinge on articulating these concepts and refining your skills. And that means facilitation is going to be a crucial part of each project. So let's go into breakout rooms for a few minutes in a moment. And let's imagine that you, you are going to be participating in one of these lifetime educational projects. Maybe it's going to last a few months in this case. And the project is turning some waste ground into a nature reserve or a play park. And imagine that your project contains people of all ages. So you might have a seven-year-old, a 14-year-old, 21-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 70-year-old. Everyone through different stages of their life are part of this project. And have a think in your group of what you might learn at each of those different ages, the ages that interest you, some young, some middle, some old. What would you hope to learn by participating in this waste ground project? And you might think of what you'd learn that has something to do with history, maths, or math, as Doug would call it, what you might learn from the perspective of being interested in language, what might you learn in science, what physical skills might you develop in a waste ground into nature reserve project, what could you learn about teamwork, leadership, economics, philosophy, politics, technology, what sorts of learning would go on for each person at these different ages or stages if they were engaged together in that kind of a project. So let your imaginations run wild, speculate and enjoy a conversation, and we'll come back in five minutes and hear some thoughts. Thank you. Okay, so the breakout rooms are ready and with a new people. So five minutes. You can, I, I wasn't reading it. So you can pick up on it. If there's anything you want to bring in. Yeah, I think, I think, I think there was a kind of a, I, I trust people also to, to read it. So I think I, I don't see anything that's that, that needs to be mentioned. Okay. Okay, 
Okay, I think everybody's back. Welcome back, everybody. I would be interested to hear anything that happened in your breakout room that you thought was interesting, that you would like to report. Maybe you heard some words of wisdom from somebody else, or maybe you spoke some words of wisdom yourself that you would like to share with us. Nadine is looking very eager there. Yeah, no, we just, we focus on this intergenerational aspect and how worth it is to have like people with no luggage at all and then the experience on the other level and it's so important to be open-minded and to see, okay, wow, this is great and this is great and to see uh, no luggage can be helpful and a lot of luggage can be helpful and this- Yeah, you know, if you were doing a nature project like that, making a park or something, one morning you could bring in an archaeologist to explain about the different levels of ground, which would be interesting to the seven-year-old and the 70-year-old. And then they'd say goodbye and you'd get on with doing the work. Thanks, Nadine. Anyone else from any of the groups? Doug was writing like about learning each other's language. If you think of like different languages in different generations, mm. like, like slang or just the, the language older people use and and how that might affect the communication. Indeed. Yep. And actually, um, Paolo has a very, very unique experience of like witnessing what is what happened really with people who are from different age groups work together. Paolo, mm -hmm. do do you want to share with yep. the start? You know, with mm -hmm. us to start. Yes, uh, what I noticed is was that uh, I worked with a group uh, from seven years old to eight years old. And uh, what I saw that was uh, a connection between young people and old people. Instead, the middle uh, aged were the most detached from, uh, from them. And uh, what I was telling uh, to Mamiko was that uh, there is an economic theory, the long waves that say that uh, there are the generation alternate their experience. One, gener one generation grew up in an expansion world, mm -hmm. and the next one in the contraction. So I remember uh, mm -hmm. when. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the last century, there was uh, an uh, economic uh, <laughs> expansion that ended with the First World War. Then, after it, there was a contraction phase with the rise of a totalitarianism. Then, a new and the Second World War. Then, a new growing phase of economic uh, well, and then with the oil crisis, a new contraction. So old men and young men share the same, not the same uh, world, but the same kind of world. So they have a connection that uh, fathers with, uh, <laughs> with children, with sons, uh, cannot have because uh, they live in a different uh, world. Mm -hmm. I think there are two things to say about the worlds that we are living in, that you've identified, is that our world is created very much by this age group, rather than if we were in projects, it would be created by a range of age groups. And so it would be easier to get on with people um, it's, it's easy in some cases and difficult in others because of these waves you talk about. But if we mix it up from the start in projects, there'd be none of that barrier happening at all. And we could still use the physical locations of schools when we want to come into something where a room together is appropriate. We could still be with our own year group if we wanted to play sports for a while with people who are the same size as us. Uh, we keep that, we're yes anding it and shifting it around. Maybe one more comment and then we'll move on.
anyone else want to share something that they heard or was in their group or that they thought of at any time along the way? Looks like okay. okay. Uh, yes, I'm just thinking of, I saw recently on TV, um, there's this fabulous Australian documentary series called Old People Home for Four-Year-Olds. And it was a, a social experiment with academic uh, input. Senior citizens in a senior citizen's home were put together with 10 or 11 um, four-year-old kids who came from the local community and they just played games together and did activity, create art, creativity, sport, all kinds of um, activities together. Um, and the research was about the benefits to both the old people and the four-year-olds. Um, so uh, fascinating and fun documentary series. I would turn that into normal. And then mm. the weird experiment would be putting people exactly the same age in a room together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the moment, it's completely the other way around. Isn't that strange? Thank you all so much um, for 